Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I'm Matt, and I'm from New Zealand, as you m probably didn't know from my accent. Uh, is anyone here from New Zealand by any chance? Oh, yes, excellent. <laughs> I, was, I had this whole list of things I was going to ask, so if no one here was from New Zealand, I was going to say, well, has anyone heard of New Zealand? And has anyone... It, yeah, okay, great. I'm just making sure. Cool. So, yeah, I, um, I make music with computers, and the JavaScript part is pretty recent. Uh, I've been doing music a lot longer than I've been writing JavaScript. But uh, I'm going to tell you today about how the two worlds collided for me uh, about three years ago. And uh, you're going to hear what uh, I was going to tell you basically the entire story. So, yeah, sit back and enjoy. Uh, and hopefully at the end, I'll be able to show you uh, my music app that I'm developing. And I'll try and make a song with it based on uh, some stuff from yesterday. So, computer music. I'm sure a few of us here are familiar with the concept. So this is Ableton Live. This is the software that I've used for quite a long time now. And it's, um, it's a way of making music where you, you're basically putting all of the individual notes in by hand, well, with the mouse. So I have uh, about uh, five, six different instruments here. And so the first one we've got is uh, a synthesized bell sound. And so all those sounds you're hearing, I've actually gone in here and I have manually put them in with a mouse. Actually, I may have recorded this using a MIDI keyboard, but I'll, I'll get to that later. And, but but the, the point is that I have complete control over everything that is happening here. I, I see the entire timeline out in front of me very much like a composer would. I'm, I'm not actually playing an instrument here. I am telling the computer where I want to hear sounds. So I'm going to play you a little bit of this song, just so you can hear how it all comes together. Oops. So you see, there's a marker moving left to right, showing the position, and you can see the events being played as it scrolls past. <laughs> Thanks. So with this way of making music, it's more like you're painting your song rather than uh, playing your song. You're in complete control of every single thing that happens. And it's actually quite a fun way to make music, particularly at first, because you don't actually have to be particularly skilled at anything. You can just put things in and they make cool sounds. And that's what I was doing back in 2006. I was just having fun, making interesting compositions on my computer. I had a few friends that were interested in it too, and we were just, just basically hanging out at school, not doing any work, and just making music. Uh, and then I grabbed a bunch of all the songs that I'd made, and I uploaded them to the internet. And I made some fancy cover art, and I don't know why, but some music blog thought it was really good. And they wrote this wonderful review all about my album. And then it, it got on some link sharing services. And before I knew it, I was getting hundreds of visitors every day. And all these people were downloading my album. And the next thing that happened was I started receiving some fan mail. And it started off, you know, like, oh, this is great. We love your music. And the next minute was like, come play your music at our university. And how on earth do you play this? This is not, I didn't actually perform it. I, it's, it was something that, I, it's like asking, asking a painter to 
play their work live. You can't really do that, but you can get them to exhibit their work, so a reproduction of the work. Um, so yeah, how do you play music, computer music live? And the obvious way is just to recruit, recruit a bunch of musicians to actually play all the individual parts live for you. So maybe you can play the cool synth line or whatever, but you'll have someone else playing the drums and someone else uh, playing you know, the other things. And that is actually a pretty cool way of playing electronic music live. I really enjoy bands that do that. But at the same time, it's, it's a lot of work, and it's not the same thing. You're actually having to go back to the beginning and re-figure out how you're going to play your song live. So I, I have never done this, and I would love to do this, but I, yeah, this, is, this obviously wasn't the way forward. I, you need to pay them, obviously. You need to pay the musicians. And yeah, I'm, I just want to work on my own. So really, the only other option I have is to DJ my music. And this is actually the way the majority of electronic musicians or computer musicians play their music live. They are really just playing you what they created in their studio. Uh, it may be as simple as changing the tempo a little bit and mixing the songs together. Or it could get elaborate, and you could split all the individual parts of your song up. You could take like that sound there, that loop, and the drums, and then put them all on a, a special launcher. Like this, where I have all of the individual parts of the song laid out in front of me. So we've got the synth up here. Oops. We've got the drums. And we have hardware controllers. Woo so this device here is called a launch pad. It was designed for being used with this software here called Ableton Live. And you can see that this grid of all my clips actually corresponds to this grid. So when I push that there, that clip launches. If I push this button here, that whole line launches. Oops. And I also have uh, some knobs up here which control a few parameters like the filter. So, um, turn that up. That works all right. But if I wanted to veer off the path at all, if I wanted to just play the synth a little bit different, I'm kind of stuck with, I'm just stuck with this pattern here. And I'm not exactly going to come over to my computer while I'm playing and start plucking in extra notes, because that's, that's stupid and not cool, and I want to be cool. We can add another controller in that will let me play one of the instruments live. So I'm still using this for all my drums, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the synthesizers I could play live on top. So to do that, I would just select it from my list and turn the input on. And now when I play over here, and I can jam along with... Oops. <laughs> and here lies the problem, I can't even play the keyboard, so <laughs> what am I kidding? Uh, yeah. So, all this, this, this is quite a, kind of, quite a reasonable way of 
playing your compositions live. But I actually don't really find it that fun, and I tried doing this for a little while, and there was just, it was just so much work setting up everything and putting it in the perfect place, and then when you actually went to play it, you had no control. And I wanted to feel like a guitarist. They can just get up on stage, they can just start playing their instrument, and they can improvise, they can do whatever they like, they can have other people playing along with them, and like a jazz band, they just groove, and it's great. I want to be able to do that with electronic computer music. And, well, yeah, obviously JavaScript, you kind of saw that one coming, right, because it's JS Comp. But yes, JavaScript, that was where I went next. And the reason I went to JavaScript was because I know JavaScript, I don't know any other languages, and uh, yeah, I, I, I thought, let's just, let's just see if we, can, if we can add another layer of expression to this software here. So instead of me having to play everything live, or having to rely on the clips that I've already set up, I want something in between where I can play something and hit a button and that will keep looping, or I can go into a mode where everything is triggered perfectly on beat, because that is kind of the most important sound of computer music. So everything is perfectly quantized with the tempo, and if you want to make computer music, it has to be spot on, it has to be perfectly in time. And playing this isn't gonna get me that, so, what I want to do here is intercept the messages from my MIDI devices, do something clever to them, and then send them to Ableton Live. So, this device here uses a protocol called MIDI, and MIDI was invented in about 1980-something, so it's quite an old protocol, but that makes it really simple. And every music software today implements this protocol, and just about every hardware controller implements the protocol too. So just quickly, this does not make any sound on its own. All it is capable of doing is sending messages saying which button is being pressed. So using this little bit of JavaScript, Oops. We can see what's going, what the messages are that are coming out of this device. So that looks pretty simple, right? It's just a bunch of numbers. That, it's only three numbers. We can deal with three numbers. We're not passing some complex protocol here. So the first number, Sorry, the first button I push gives us 144, 48, and then either at a, some number or zero. So if I push it harder, we get a high number. If I push it softer, we get a small number. And it goes to zero when you let go. Well, this, it's complicated, but that's the easy answer. It goes to zero when you let go. If anyone's done any MIDI stuff, they'll know what I'm talking about there, maybe. Uh, so as I go up the scale, the number in the middle increases. I can add octaves. That's the zero note, and it's beautiful. If we're wanting to intercept the messages, we can capture them easy enough, but how do we then send them back uh, to Ableton Live to actually play the things we're processing? So at the moment, I'm only peeking in to the things that are coming out of here. I'm not actually able to change it in any way. But this little bit of code here lets me create what's called a virtual MIDI port. So I can pretend that I am a MIDI keyboard but it's actually my own JavaScript code. So 
So now if I run this, nothing happens yet, but in this list here, we now have a new keyboard called JavaScript Music. So I can hook that up here, and now if I run this again, so that was Node telling Ableton Live what sounds to play. And for some reason, it didn't work as well as, oh, I missed one. So I'm, I'm sending messages to both the two, the two first instruments, so they play the same thing. Now, this device here, both of these devices, they also use MIDI. It's the exact same protocol that this is using. So I can use the exact same technique to intercept the messages from the launch pads. Whoops. Rain time. And now when I push buttons here, you can see the same messages coming up. Whoops. I'm just going to disconnect from live, uh, from Ableton Live, otherwise things will get crazy. OK. So we've got 144.0, 127, let go, it goes to 0. So it's just counting up from 0 all the way along. We get to the end of the line, though, and it goes to 16. So we've got 8 here and then 16. And that could make our lives a little bit trickier in the future, but luckily I know how to solve it with maths. Now, if we send the same message back to the launch pad again that we just received, it will light up that button. Can, I don't know if you can see that on the projection, but that button is lighting up when I press it. really loud. You can all hear me right? Excellent. OK. I'll just, I'll just play along with the, uh, the wonderful rhythm outside. So how can we turn this stream of MIDI data into an object that is really easy for us to transform in interesting ways? So we're talking about being able to loop the playback. So oops, I missed something. Oh, no, I didn't. No, we're fine. <laughs> We want to be able to loop the playback. We want to be able to quantize it, align it. So I'm a real fan of the observable pattern. And this is my favorite module for creating observable uh, objects. It's, it's just JavaScript, which is what I like about it. So really, what you're doing is you're creating a object, sorry, a function. And you can actually set its value, or you can request its value just by calling it. And if you instead pass a function, it will call you back every time that changes. Now, this here is a, a very small wrapper around arrays to turn them into two dimensions. So I specify the shape I want of the array, which is three high and four across. And then I pass it some data, and it will s data, and it will stack it like that. So I can ask. What is it position 0, 1? What is it position 1, 2, et cetera, et cetera? And then this little bit of code here merges the two together. It gives us an observable grid. So every single time I play something over here, it's actually returning a whole new immutable object that represents the state of the entire launch pad at that exact moment. And whoops, try it out. So now you can see I have a grid representation of the data of, of my button presses here. And if I want to send that 
I've wanted to translate that grid back into MIDI to then forward onto Ableton Live. I can use this really complicated little function here. It's actually quite simple when you break it down. But all it's really doing is every single time there's a change to the object, it scans through to see if it can find out what's changed, and then it will send that particular message through to Ableton Live. So it, it's kind of it's converting our snapshots into back into a stream of changes. So now we can hook it up to our other grid by saying whenever the input grid changes, set that same value to the output grid. So it may not sound that exciting, but that message is going from the launch pad into JavaScript and then into the music application. So we can do anything we like now at this point. We can, we can transform what I'm doing over here in any way that we can imagine. And I can also send it to the launch pad as well, just so we get the lights lighting up. It's, it's really hard to see on this camera, unfortunately, but no, that's not going to work. It's really overexposed. Yeah. Get my white hands in there, and then we can, no, I don't know. <laughs> the, the lights are lighting up, though, believe me. OK, so this is what we have so far, like I said. Now, if we want to do anything clever with this observable object, transform it into another, another form, like like I was talking about with the looping or the quantization, we can use this module here called Observe Transform. And it's really just a special kind of observable object that does something to the data as it passes through. So you set it with one value, and it will call you to ask, it will call back and ask, what object do you want this to be? Uh, Actually, what, what object do you want to be notified to everyone else? So you can transform the data to become anything at that point. So this here is using these two other helper methods called connect and send, whoops, to just clean up our code quite a bit. So instead of having all of this stuff, we can just do that. And it becomes a lot easier to see the signal flow here. So we're taking the launch pad, and we are sending it to the output grid, and also sending it back to the, the launch pad to light up the buttons. Oops, I'm just going to. And this is a transform using that transform function we just imported before. And what, all it does is whenever there's a change, it then calls get range on that input, which is part of the array grid that I was using. It can, it, you can request just one little part of it. So every single time the main grid is changing, you'll get another grid that is only a small portion of the first grid. So we can just grab that, that one, whoops, that one part of the grid. And, whoops, how did I zoom? No. Ah, oh, this, there we go. Yeah, I had, I had three fingers, I was resting my, <laughs> okay. Uh, and we'll stick that in there. So we are slicing the grid up into a bunch of smaller grids, which are then, so we take a slice, and then we send it to the output. So the first, range is 3, 8, which means 3 down and 8 across. So it's that whole zone there. The one below it is uh, 2, 8. So it's two, 2 down and 8 across, and so on and so forth. 
and I am sending 144 for the first one, but 145 for the next one, and so on and so forth. So that actually lets me split it out into different channels in my software. Whoops, channel two, channel three, channel four, channel five, and channel six. So if I save that and then run it, I get a big error because I deleted the input grid. Wait, why is the input? Oh, I've probably got a console.log in here somewhere. There we go. Get rid of that. So now this first line here, the first three lines, play the, the bells instrument, but the next one down. Whoops. Oh, no. And we've got, what else, we've got drums down here somewhere. That's working pretty great. Uh, but as I said before, the most important thing about computer music is that everything is perfectly in time. And there's just no way that I can play as perfect as a computer. And there are certainly people that do have the skills to do this. And if you look them up on YouTube, you can find some amazing performances, people that are actually playing things live with your fingers. But I can't do that, and I don't want to do that, and I don't think it really represents computer music anyway. It's, it's another art form, and it's great, but it's not computer music. So, how do we quantize? How do we align things perfectly with the clock? Ableton Live has the ability to send out a clock signal. And what that really is is just a pulse. At a certain, it's 24 times it will send a pulse perfectly aligned to the current tempo every beat. So that's quite a few ticks every second. At 120 beats per minute, that's like 48 different events. Uh, and we can hook into that clock using another virtual MIDI port, like this. So we are, we're now listening on clock input as well. And if we log that out, you'll see a whole bunch of messages coming in. And that's coming in extraordinarily fast. It's coming in at 107 beats per minute. So that'll be 24, I don't know, math, hard. So I'm going to use a computer to figure that out for me. So this little bit of code here creates another observable object. Every single time it receives that message 248, it increments this value here. And it also figures out the current beat by then dividing the number by 24 again. So what you get out of this. Uh, is the current playback position. So we've got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And if I change the tempo here, you can see that number getting faster. It's incrementing faster. And if I bring it down, it goes slower. See? Perfect. Uh, 120. Um, OK, so now that we've got the current position, we can use that as part of our transformation. So instead of just taking one little section of the grid, we're going to be, I guess instead of doing a spatial transform, we're doing a temporal transform. And we can hook it up. So I, I'll quickly explain how this works. Every single time its value changes, either the input value or this current position, which is that new observer we, we just created, this function down here gets run. And we're using a little bit of mathematics, no, just kidding, um, to figure out, so, so we've got a, a rate. So we want to quantize to every beat, for instance. So I can't play faster than each beat. If I hold down a note, it will just keep re-triggering that beat. So we're just finding out 
if we are at the start of that or not, and if so, we capture that frame, and then we keep playing that frame back until we get to halfway through, and then we just return nothing. And that sounds like, it sounds really cool, I promise you. So we stick it in here. The launch pad flows into the repeater, and then it gets sent out to all the different instruments. That's great, yeah. That's really great. And like, once I discovered that, if I actually tell the story correctly, that was one of the later things I discovered. I was doing the looping stuff first, and then I found that's actually the main thing you need, is being able to hold the buttons down and have it trigger perfectly in time. So it's, it's kind of like you are playing chords of time, if that makes sense. So I'm holding down buttons, and instead of it creating a nice chord in the musical sense, it's actually creating one over a, a bigger time frame, which is, yeah, never mind, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it made sense in my head before I said it. But say we do actually want to be able to loop what I've just played. So say I'm playing a really cool drum beat, but I want to free up my, my hand again so that I can then play something else. So in order to do that, it's actually quite simple. Because we have the entire state at all times, we can ask, what is the current state of the, of, of the launch pad? Uh, we can record each event. We can record each event. And <laughs> it is alive. And, and then we can go back in time and, and get those events later, and we can take just one little chunk of the, of the things that have just been played. So I can be playing something, and it's recording everything I'm doing at all times. And then when I push that button there, I want it to go back in time and retrieve everything I just played and keep it playing. That's what this function here does. Um, so this is really simple. All it's doing is every time there is a change, it's then just pushing it onto, the, onto an array. It's, Really straightforward. And this one here is just doing a filter on that array to get the, the range that I've asked for. And that just lets me listen to when I'm pushing the button that I say I want to loop, and it takes the slice. And this here plays, plays it back. So this is just a reverse transform. It's taking the current loop, and it is checking to see what the current time is. And if the current time corresponds to, to an event in the loop, it will change its state and broadcast that out. So, yeah, well, we, that's what we want. And I would love to live code it for you, but I've only got 10 more minutes. So instead, I am going to just give you one I prepared earlier, which is right here. Node MIDI looper. And I've also added a few more things, like I've lit these buttons here up so I can see where things are. So that's like an undo and redo, and I've got down here I can change the rate of repeating. Start that again, that was really weird. Um.
go. <laughs> Oh yeah. So what about web audio? This is not web audio, this is Node.js. And all I'm doing is processing a stream, turning into another form and then putting it straight out. This is just like any old streaming web server, really. And but what if, can we just get rid of Ableton Live altogether and just do this all in web audio? And I really wish I'd never asked that question. I wish I'd just stuck with doing this. This is so simple and great, and you can explain it in one little 40-minute talk. But no, I, I went down this rabbit hole, and I, I've actually gone and built my own application based on the exact th same things I've shown you here. But it all runs on top of web audio. So I haven't got really time to talk about the technology behind it, but we've got uh, there's a module I've written called Audio Slot, which uh, it lets you create, uh, it's, it's, it's an observable object just like everything else, so you can put it on your grid and do clever things with it, and you can declare what sound you want, and it will build the necessary web audio stuff like what Paul was talking about, uh, but it does it for you so you don't have to worry about hooking everything up. It just makes it a lot easier to wire everything together. Uh, so I've got that, and I, no, I won't, I won't show you this, I will just show you my app, so I can play you. I can play your whole song if we if we do it now. So let's do it. Okay. So we'll close Node. Don't need that anymore. And that, and close Ableton Live. Sorry, Ableton. <sighs> and down here, I have my app called Loop Drop. And I'll open the project. Now, when I was just out the back before, I quickly put together some sounds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I really like Douglas, Douglas Crockford. He's great. Um, but it's, it's just really cool hearing him, him like regretting his decisions about JavaScript. What did he say? Um, oops, that's not going. Oh, great, here we go. Technical difficulties. Mm -hmm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to have to shuffle my ports around a bit until they work. It's, it's not my app's fault. It is a problem with USB 3 and compatibility or something. I don't know. Hopefully, it'll work now. Now nothing's working. Oh, wait. No, it's because I didn't hook it. Oh, gosh. I didn't hook it up. Yeah. We're good. We're good. Everything's fine. Cool. So uh, let's bring that up so we can see it. OK. JavaScript is a hot mess. JavaScript was designed in 10 days. And it turns out you can make a lot of mistakes in 10 days. <laughs> But the good news about JavaScript is that there's actually a brilliant little language hidden inside of it. And, and it works. Now, the reason I think the web has survived and prospered to this point is because there is JavaScript in the browser. Now, whatever is wrong with HTML, whatever is wrong with CSS, with JavaScript, we can fix it. We can work around it. Thank you. 
don't know where that was. I don't know where that was going. I'm just going to stop. Shut up. Stop talking. We can fix it. We can fix it. We can work around it. We can fix it. I like that. Yes, yeah, nice. Oh, that was in case I forgot the, the link to the video. We got it there. So yes, this is my application. It's called LoopDrop. It is fully open source. Uh, you can look at the code. You can uh, hack on it. You can do whatever you like. Uh, but you can also no, I won't, uh, no, you can you can buy it as well. Yeah. If you if you don't want to like if you don't know how to use npm, then you can buy it. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to encourage a new kind of open source where uh, people that can develop, uh, sorry, can contribute de by developing, can get it for free, but people that uh, just want to like use it and abuse it, they can pay me. It's great. Uh, so everything you saw is JavaScript, uh, HTML, CSS, all that stuff. But I'm using Electron, which is a wonderful tool by GitHub, to package it all up and turn it into an application that actually runs on your desktop and it has access to everything Node has as well. So it's Chrome and Node.js smacked together. So I can have full file system access, which is great for an audio application, because it means you don't have to be worrying about shifting large samples around the internet. Now, Destroy With Science. This is the name of my band. Uh, everything kind of got a bit crazy once I started uh, playing with this stuff, and my old band name just didn't seem to fit. It was Luna. And, uh, uh, yeah, so you, if you want, you can listen to some of my interesting experiments. So every, every single uh, Thursday night, I play a live session uh, at, at a hack group uh, in my city. And usually I play for an hour long, and, um, and I put them on SoundCloud. So you can check them out. Um, and yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just did it. I just started and learned an awful lot along the way, very much like what... Uh, oh, in, in a couple of talks before about the, the textiles, uh, about the, the knitting, it's the exact same thing. You, you, it's amazing what you can learn when you just start doing interesting things like this and, and reaching out. And, but I have learned some important takeaways from all this. So yeah, just start writing. But you need to keep on rewriting over and over and over and over and over again. But don't do the whole thing at once. Don't just throw everything away. Just Rewrite the parts that bother you right now, and try and keep it modular so that you don't have to throw everything away when you want to make a change. Yeah, that's what all I've got. So thanks so much. Wow. Amazing.